Well, welcome back from break. Was it a good break? Yes. Yeah, did anyone uh, work on getting their wills done? I know, it's such an exciting topic. All right, now we're gonna be talking about communication Aikido. It's a topic I created to help first responders, and first responders are known to be really great with action, not so good with communication, right? They just say something horrific, and you say, how you doing? Fine. How was your day? Good, right? You don't hear it. So I've had several family members already come up to me, and the issue of communication is top notch. If you talk, you're more likely to talk about uh, things meaningful if we set the tone. So hopefully we'll be setting the tone today and tomorrow for doing that. I just talked with the kids. The kids are awesome um, and they've been giving us advice and stuff. I'll be uh, discussing what the kids had to say as we go. Tomorrow there's an expert panel at 10. It's going to be the kids interviewing some of the soldiers that are more seasoned. And so if you have five questions or one question that you think the kids should be asking, if you wouldn't mind texting it to me. And again, my text, let me see if I put it here. Nope, I didn't. The text is 954-609-9904. I've, I've had that slide up before. Okay. No, none of the kids scared me out. In fact, they were really awesome. I have to say, the Army makes cuter kids than other groups, and we have some be beautiful little babies. So there you go. All right, so again, here's the slogan that the kids and I came up with, with Jeff Kostick from Flying Chimp Media. Maximize your soldier's effectiveness by improving happiness, and now the other part of it, communication. So let's see if we can get her done. It's all about national pride. If we can communicate, we can conquer the world in a different way at home, in the community, and in the world. Uh, communication Aikido. Who knows what Aikido is? What's Aikido? Sir? It's a martial art, yes? It's a martial art where it controls our body. Okay, so you can control uh, by grabbing onto a wrist. I had one woman said if you just put a ring on her finger, she can be controlled control better. But this is the wrist. Okay, what else? What else is communication keto, sir? Keto is kind of unique because it's used to protect the person while you're trying to. All right, so here's he talking, thank you. Here's he talking about protecting. So a keto is you come at me with something, and instead of me fighting you, I take you and I make your energy go this way, right? I help you go along your way so that no one gets hurt. No harm, no foul, right? Communication keto. then I created that term. Um, a long time ago, I was a martial artist, and the reason I got into working with war fighters and, and wounded individuals is that we were all part of a martial arts tour class when we were competing, and I learned how just difficult it was for even these very seasoned people to talk. So let's look at the goals. Build rapport from any zip code. Tomorrow we'll be talking about remote syncing. Some ideas that uh, the kids have and that other families have had. Embracing nonverbal communication. Mastering three levels of anger. Improving your listening mojo. And again, that ever-present personal action plan that you'll tell your humor buddy. Again, here it is. There's that slide. Text me. We want some questions that the kids can ask. The kids are going to come up with some too, but I figured if you, if someone here has a question, like I had a few moms come up to me, says, you know, my son doesn't talk to me. You know, what questions do you have that we can have the kids ask so that everyone is more comfortable? We speak as one voice in this room. All right, great beginnings or not? So some things just don't smell any better when you hold them in, right? 
And that's the same with a lot of feelings, a lot of worries, a lot of concerns. And I, I like Shrek the best, who says, he's one of my favorite philosophers, better out than in. All right. So we'll be looking at that. So I created the Douche and Smile Quiz. I stole the idea from Dr. David Matsumoto, who is not only a psychologist, but a coach in the Olympics for wrestling. And he noticed that you could tell who won certain awards by how they were smiling before and then afterwards. And I think a lot of it is, again, the red shoe attitude, how we move forward. So douche and smile is from the Renaissance period. It means genuine smile. So now, which one's the douche and smile, A or B? So OK, some people said B. Why B? Because it's not as big. Bigger's not always the issue, ma'am. OK. And how about A? A, OK, why A? The eyes give it away. OK, so and there's the secret. It's all in the eyes. So with a douche and smile, not only does the eyes crinkle up, but they, this part seems to go down. And you can't fake that so easily. Anyone here who's a photographer knows that a wedding that's happy needs two sets of photos because everyone's smiling like this, right? I know when I'm really happy, I have no eyes. And so with a, we say as a blessing to people on special events, may you require two sets of photos. Because the douche and smile is not always the prettiest one to look at, but it does make us smile. All right, how about, what are the seven basic universal emotions? This is according to Dr. David Matsumoto. Love, what else? Anger. Happiness, anger, fear. You guys are doing great. All right, anger, happiness, sadness, you got the top three. Whoa. Surprise, disgust, fear. People often don't think of disgust as an emotion, but it is. In fact, if you look at people making apologies on TV, some maybe political figures or sports figures that we might know, they often have this look of disgust and disdain on their face. Just look, all right? And then contempt. The worst thing in the world in an emotion is contempt. When you get to the point of contempt, there's almost no point of return. If you can come back from contempt in a unit, a table group, a family, a love relationship, then your relationship is forged like the best martial arts sword in the world with the hottest forge in the world, the hottest flame, and it's forever strong. If you can come back for it, but it's rare. Okay, now, at the Olympics, who do you think is the most unhappy smiler, gold, silver, or bronze? Bronze, okay, why bronze? Because it's not real. <laughs> Because it's a fake bronze or silver. Why silver? Because they're the first loser. All right. And absolutely, you're right. So now, who here is the most unhappy smiler? Who won silver? A, B, or C? A, B, or C? You think C? Silver? Yeah. Or A? All right. Let's take a look. It is actually C. You had it right. And if you look at the smiles, he's like, <laughs> Because he's thinking, if I only had one less Twinkie, I'd have made it, right? If I hadn't had that beer last night, he almost had it. Which is why, by the way, when we're trying to reach goals, many of us stop short of victory, you know? And Freud called it flight from health. We're afraid to risk doing well and being well, so we sabotage our, ourselves in little ways, right? And anyone who's had a goal knows that we're all susceptible to that. It's just part of the process. All right, who won silver, A, B, or C? B, we got, we got split. I was wrong. I chose B because he had that little gun, and I thought it was like sour grapes. But it is A. Now, some people are harder to tell that with different cultures and stuff like that. People can be more polite or less smiley. I remember when I first came to this country, one of my classmates thought that I was not smart because I smiled so much, and so I think we have different assumptions sometimes in different cultures. In fact, I spent two weeks in the class for children who are intellectually limited. <laughs> and the funny part is my twin sister didn't get put in that class. <laughs> I still hear about that from time to time. All right, silver, who won silver here, A, B, or C? C. C? Let's see. It's A, but C, because of the context is a Special Olympics, they're all just so glad to be there, it's very hard. So depending on the context, it can be very hard to tell if someone's really happy or unhappy, right? 
because the context here, they're just happy to be there. And I've worked with some of the para-athletes, and they're just amazingly happy to be there. And they have great speaking careers afterwards, I might say. All right, so who won the silver here? A, A, B, B, or C, C? A, A, all right. And here, this is actually a test of intelligence and visual acuity, silver, gold, bronze. I didn't cover it up, right? And the reason I didn't is because just like with anything, we take shortcuts in our brain. Our neurons make connections. And I got you used to looking just at the faces, right? And then now you forget to pull back. So pre-deployment, mid, post, whatever, we get used to focusing on the little thing. Everything's OK as long as dinner's on time. And sometimes people get all upset, dinner was late a minute, because they focus everything on that one thing. So what is your narrow focus on? And broaden it. That really helps with making each deployment a do-over. All right, so there you have silver, gold, bronze. Duchenne smile. All right. <laughs> hey. <laughs> All right, now, in the world of knowing how to read somebody, there's always tells. I'm a terrible poker player. As you can tell, I don't hide my feelings. I can't lie to save my life. I, I, I like, look so guilty or look so happy with my cards. I got a straight, you know. Uh, and so you don't want to play cards. Well, you do want to play cards with me. Um, here are some of the speaking skills when we're speaking one-on-one -on -one or in a crowd. You can tell someone by their smile. So if I'm uncomfortable, we're going to look at how people look when they're uncomfortable or when they're lying, because it's the same thing in terms of how they look, right? So if I'm lying to you or I'm uncomfortable, what are my eyes doing? Looking away. They're looking away. What else? Down. They might be looking down. All right. And how about my eye contact? What are my eyes doing in terms of eye contact? Yeah. None? OK, so it might be none, or it might be too much because I'm psyching you out. I'm not lying, right, honey? No. I did not sleep with her. All right. So the issue is how we look at someone makes a difference. OK. Gestures. What do I do with my gestures when I'm lying or uncomfortable? I fidget. OK, what else? OK, I might do a lot of hand gestures. This side represent? I wear lingerie? No, I don't think so. What else? Huh? OK, I might cross my arms. So we have body language that we can read. And it doesn't always make the scene, because the women in this room without any you know, cellulite are cold. All right? Luckily, I'm feeling just fine. All right. How about body movements? What does my whole body do? Am I standing straight, or I move around? What do I do with my body? I'm what? I might be moving around a lot. OK. I might also do the opposite and be perfectly still. How about my voice? What does it do when I'm uncomfortable? I might get very loud or very soft, right. And it might get high and cracky. Uh, what had happened was, OK. Um, I had, I, I said, I told you I raised um, six kids. And one of them, I could always tell when he was lying. Because he'd go, Mom. <coughs> he always had that little, and his shoulders were up to here. I thought, oh, good, what's he done now? All right. And then energy. What does my energy do when I'm uncomfortable and when I'm lying? All right, it sizzles. All right, so now I want you to practice. In your little groups, and some of, I know this isn't the best seating for that, but you guys are army strong. You can figure it out. With two or three people or more, I want you to pick a group. Find a group right now. Pick a group. And then tell me, raise your hands when you've picked a group. I want to know, because we got the next step. We got one person. Thank you, sir. He's picked his group. Raise your hand when you pick the group. OK, we're doing pretty well. All right, we see shaking hands. is almost like a raising hand. Now, in your group, on the count of three, point to the person who's the designated liar. One, two, three. <laughs> OK, now we've got voluntold person over here. And he's a designated liar for everybody, because he did raise his hand for everybody. All right, we appreciate that. OK. Now, the best way to learn how to notice something is to do it, right? So my designated liars in the room, I want you to think of three facts. One true fact, no, two true facts and one false fact, all right? And tell them. Now, don't write them down. Just remember them. And then those of you who are going to listen in the little group that you've chosen, I don't mind noise. It's OK. I've raised lots of kids. We're good. Um, and 
those listening, you have to look at the tells and see if you can tell if someone was lying or not. Again, we're not looking to see who's lying, but really how uncomfortable people are. It's just more fun to look at it for lying. Okay, does everyone know what they're doing? The, the designated liar is going to tell three facts. One of them is false. And then, as soon, and then you tell them, as soon as your little group knows which is the lie, they say it. Ready, set, lie. Wanna, you want to join anybody? You two could do it. Oh, okay. I love my kids, and I'm home all the time. You're a liar. <laughs> the last one you were lying about. Your eyebrows raised. It's not very scary. Did you guess it? He's, he's, he's a liar. You're a good liar. I have training. I used to be an interrogator. Congratulations. Hey, wait, does this need to be a personal fact or a in fact? Personal fact. It should be a personal That's fact. That's what I thought. She's talking about diabetes education. And that's, I, just I should have made that clearer. And for fatality reading. I don't know. But it doesn't matter because you could still kind of tell by by her face. Me too. Me too. I've got this face. She does not lie at all. She doesn't. That's what you have to teach her. I just gotta learn. I can't lie either. Yeah. So can you at least? I can't lie. Okay. Good. How did it go? Oh, you're not playing. That's all right. All right, it sounds like most of you are already done. All right, raise your hand if you were the designated liar and you stumped the chumps. No one guessed the right one. If you fooled everyone, raise your hand if you fooled everyone. In other words, my good liars, raise their hands. Only one? <laughs> you caught them? Everyone else got caught? Holy moly, you're terrible liars. Uh, that's a good thing in a person, however. <laughs> All right. So how did you know they were lying? How did you do with these things? How'd you know? I kept a straight face the whole time. Body, you, you kept what? I kept a straight face the whole time. You kept, okay, you kept a straight face. How'd you know he was lying then? Uh, oh, yeah, I, yeah. I caught it. <laughs> <laughs> he fooled mom, not dad. All right. I asked one woman, how did she know that her, her man um, was lying? She said his lips were moving. <laughs> and that's funny, not nice again, but very funny. OK. <laughs> All right. How else did you know they were lying? Any other? Oh, one person over here was saying that the face got all scrunched up and the eyebrows went up, right? I think it was that group, the eyebrows, all right? All right, so we are pretty good at noticing, but you have to be paying attention first, right? Now, I hear that there's a joke about a technique for handling explosives and the idea of stomping around. Um, and I heard it's a joke about another nationality, which I won't state. But, I've heard that one too. Yes, you've heard that one, okay. So one of the questions is, is here with sappers, anyone dealing with with anything that has to do with explosives. How is an explosive device anything different than a relationship? Nothing, handle it with care, right? And if you stomp around, it's gonna explode. So now, I've taken some polls of the yellow ribbon and here's some more of those alleged polls. The number one problem with sinking when you're either just ready to go or when you're gone or when you've come back, doesn't matter, unrealistic expectations. The more you can talk about the expectations now, the better. Some of you aren't talking at all. I know that. I know that some of you because you had seen some elbows when I said that. And besides, I've talked with some of you in between. Oh, oh. Sorry, I got clicker happy. Too much too soon? All right. So one of the ideas is, are you talking about stuff or doing stuff 
too much too soon? What's the right time for everyone? When do you begin to pack? When do you make the packing list? When do you plan the party that's going to say we're, we're, we're wishing you well, the, the going away party, the happy deployment party? Um, privacy and respect. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Yes? Okay, you have to decide ahead of time. Do you want to know, if you're the soldier going away to Afghanistan, do you want to know back home if the toilet just overflowed and ruined the whole carpet? Yeah. Or, yeah, or do you not want to know until the thing's fixed? My friend, when her husband went away for the first appointment, he's had seven. Um, for the first appointment, a deployment, as soon as she was driving away um, to take him off, we, unbeknownst to us, the toilet was overflowing. So when we got back to her house, it was flooded. And so it took us hours to figure out how to fix it. And it turns out I'm not a plumber, but it took Home Depot, three gay neighbors, and five toolboxes to figure out that it was just that little black floaty thingy. All right, so you have to figure out when do you want to know? Like, do you tell them right away, by the way, the, the carpet's overflowed? Some people want to know, some don't. I think it's just a matter of personal preference. And also, if you make a mistake with money, with sexual decision making, with anything, with the car, uh, anything at all, do you want to know? So that's something to ask, whether it's your parents, or your sweetie, or a sibling, or a grandparent, whatever. Find out, each person's different. Too much or too little talking? We all know that one person wants to know every detail, all the time, 24 seven. And we know those who the whole thing they say all day is, yeah, yeah no, it's okay. So find a way to respect those differences. Deployment problems. The number one deployment problem had to do with role changes. Yep. yep. And associated with that is the keeper of the checkbook. I talked with a soldier who was in sincere distress. He was trying to balance his checkbook from Afghanistan. Do you think it went well? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> And so the issue is, you know, make, you've talked to some financial people here, try and make wise decisions. The person that is closest to you is not necessarily the best with money. Make wise choices. Who's going to make decisions about your stuff, your children, your money, your whatever, right? Your motorbike, whatever. Um, decision making is different. My friend, during the first deployment, her husband came home and she painted their room. Yes, wait for it. Pink. Ooh, now, she didn't ask him and she didn't tell him, don't ask, don't tell, she said. But he didn't like pink. So, and it was Pepto-Bismol pink. I didn't like the, the color. Yeah, I know, ooh. So the issue is, do you think she was maybe a little mad at him for being gone? Passive aggressive, the gift that keeps on giving. All right, so the issue is, how are you going to handle role changes and decision making? Full disclosure again, and old problems, new problems. Um, he went away for his fifth deployment because they were having marital difficulties. Do you think he came back and it was fixed? No, but she had a really good break. Okay. So what makes you angry? This is another poll, the Yellow Ribbon. What are the top five things that make you angry during the deployment process? Waiting. Everything going wrong, what else? Waiting. Waiting. Too, much information. Too much information like this over and over. I mean, how many times you've had each brief, right? What else? Lack of communication, too much communication, all right. Stupid people was number one. <laughs> now, I might just say, it's just my opinion, but I think we all take our turn at stupid. Have you taken your turn today? Twice. Twice? <laughs> I take my turn all the time, so just remember, keep that in mind. Tied with Yellow Ribbon Program. Remember, I'm asking people to yellow ribbon events. Even though they're really great, everyone likes to, there's always a bad part to anything good. And since I grew up in the Vietnam era, in fact, when I was 18, I went to enlist in the Vietnam War because I was a patriot and wanted to, wanted to do well. I became a citizen when I was in middle school. I don't know if you can see my tacky pin. When I became a citizen, I got a bunch of tacky pins that now that I'm an old lady, I like them. So I actually wear them. But I went to enlist when I was 18. They wouldn't even take my name. Sorry, ma'am, you don't have the right equipment. And I said, well, I could go get a gun. No, ma'am, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> and so I said, uh, so I thought if I was big and bad and tough, they'd let me in. So I said, but sir, I could get one whenever I want. <laughs> <laughs> he said, ma'am, it has to be your own. I thought, okay. So, <laughs> so there's disappointments in every situation, whether you're at a deployment or you can't enlist or maybe that you did enlist. I mean, there's always issues. Waiting in line, someone had said waiting. Rude drivers, 
Now, I used to live in Miami. I live in Fort Lauderdale area now. And one thing you know is they drive and they give you that special salute with that middle finger, right? Because I tend to, when I have my grandbabies in the car, I drive speed limit. I know that's very rude. I apologize ahead of time, right? How rude of me to be careful. Okay. So I get that middle finger from time to time, right? I call it the Miami salute. So I used to get mad and think, ram them, right? Get them. Or go slower or do something passive aggressive. But you know what? That doesn't do anything. Then I thought, you know what? I could really mess with their minds with love and joy and gratitude. Oh, and be a little aggressive at the same time. What a gift. So I started doing this. <laughs> and they look at me like, what's this crazy broad doing? Is she the Sunday school teacher? Is she my neighbor? Is she the pastor's wife? Well, who is this woman? And you know what? I got a 65 to 70% return of people kind of behaving and letting me in and backing off and being nice. And I even get a, bit, a bunch of waves. So just think about how you can mess with someone with love and joy. Remember, the red shoe attitude. All right. And then we have lateness. And we know we have the hurry up and wait. And there's lots of lateness having to do with any military event. Is this the solution? Not nice. It's tempting, isn't it? Now, I had one FRG leader who asked me, but Dr. Gurry, do you sell those? She said, that would be a great fundraiser for our soldiers and their families. And I thought, well, maybe we should. Maybe we should. Is this the solution? All right, now, I apologize for the cursing, but funny, not nice. Um, I got this from the same chaplain, Chaplain Cresselius. And dealing with wounded warriors, we know there's the military lingo, and there's nothing funnier than a cute little chicky singing gospel, cursing, and ending with a salute, right? Funny. All right, so if you want to hear it again, I can do it again. Yeah. All right, and you got to sing along then. All right, you ready? I'm going to kick somebody's ass. Very helpful in relieving stress, and I guarantee some of you will be humming this the next time you're mad at someone. In fact, many families now, they, they just start humming it, and it dispels some of the anger. All right. So now, good communication is as stimulating as black coffee and just as hard to sleep after. It's one of my favorite quotes. Which is why we avoid good communication. it's hard to know what people are saying. I saw one couple many years ago in my office for marital um, uh, session, and they were fighting for 20 years about the farm he wanted to have. Finally, I asked him, what do you mean by farm? What's your farm look like? And he described it. She went, oh. She thought he meant cows and pigs and stinky things you have to take care of. All he wanted was a nice house in the country with lots of land. Oh. Asking questions, one of the secrets of the universe. All right. Polite shut-ups. This reminds me of my brother. Is this the solution? Yes, yeah. yeah, sometimes. Just shut it, right? My, one of my kids used to do this to me to shut me up. 
you know, pretending you're squeezing the head? I think that's funny. Okay. <laughs> and I always teach all the kids, it's your job to shut me up. You can shut me up politely. So here's some things hot outside, and the one says shut up, all right? <laughs> Sometimes it's when we're cranky, even the obvious question can just send us over the edge. So the kids and I, the military kids, came up with, a, there are many polite shut-ups in this world. These are just some we came up with. Personal power. Now I have an assignment for you. The next time you're in a crowded room, I want you to stand perfectly still and have it so that your shoulders are like this so your hands are loose and just sit there and send good thoughts. See how people react. That's personal power. If you can walk into a place and be quiet, people somehow notice that energy and they come to you especially in this culture where we don't ever have silence and everyone's always moving, right? It's about gravitas. You create a personal power that's the best way to shut anyone up or have influence on anyone. And it's a nice way and it doesn't produce wrinkles. All right, saying I love you. Now kids know this best. They have chocolate over their face. I didn't eat the chocolate cake, I love you, you know? <laughs> and you go, oh, I love you too. And you, of course, you go back to the chocolate cake thing. All right. Thank you. Thanking someone is a great way to change the subject and shutting them up. I'm sorry. Now, military, you guys are terrible at I'm sorry. So on the count of three, we're going to say I'm sorry. We're going to practice. Ready? One, two, three. I'm sorry. Oh, I forgive you. All right. Doesn't it feel good? Now, remember, there's several parts to an apology. You have to say you're sorry for what you did, and you've got to name the thing. And then you have to have the other person say they forgive you. I'll get right on that. One of the number one reasons why anyone gets in a fight with anyone or there's any conflict is someone didn't do what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it, or how they were supposed to do it, right? If they could only do it my way, which is the right way. I know all of us feel that way, right? right. Yes. And it's just my way and his way. All right. Now, you're right telling someone you're right. You're right. You're right. I did blow it. You're right. I did eat the chocolate. I got out of a speeding ticket because the officer said, you know, give me a reason why I shouldn't give you a ticket. I said, well, you should give me a ticket, but because I'm so honest and polite, you won't, right? And he said, okay. So <laughs> it helps sometimes to be direct, right? And there's a joke. Now, my favorite joke about the tickets is a guy was uh, pulled over by a, a highway patrol. The guy says, look, it's the end of my shift. I don't want to write you up. If you can give me a reason um, why you're speeding that I've never heard before, I'll let you off. And he said, officer, 20 years ago, some state patrolman ran off with my wife. I thought you were returning her. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all in how we handle opportunities, right? There's opportunity for humor and for power. And then the last one is my twin sister solution, Elena. When they were first married, her husband and, 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 and they were, I was in the car with them, and they were arguing. And they were arguing because he had lied about how old he is. He's seven years younger than us. We didn't know he, that she was a cougar. <laughs> and he's a fine looking man. So the issue is, they were mad at each other. So why did you lie to me? So they were back and forth, back and forth. Finally, he had broken his finger. Finally, she said in a New York accent, how's your finger? And then they started laughing. From then on, we always say, how's your finger? And it just changes any. Every group, every unit, every company, every family, every couple has a joke they can use that, chain, that cuts all the negative energy. Whether it's, you know, clear the way, or, you know, start singing, I'm going to whip someone's ass, whatever it is. OK. So humor. Now, I created the three levels of anger when I was dealing with a bunch of wounded warriors um, who had come back very angry. And along them were some MPs who were also very angry from dealing with uh, all the anger of the job. So I didn't know how to handle these guys. I was very young at the time. I'd never been in combat. I had never been you know, a police officer. So I didn't know what I was doing exactly. But I'm a pretty good listener and pretty creative. So I figured I'd find something out. Zip, I got nothing. So that night I went home and watched the martial arts movies. And of course, Chuck Norris, my homeboy, he fixed it for me. He came up with Enter the Octagon. Anyone seen it? Yeah. Great movie. OK. In there, there was a little um, morality play. And it helped me understand different ways of personal power. So there's level three, which is my rowdy group. Do we have a rowdy group in here? No. No? <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. I, I think okay. I'm gonna make you guys my rowdy group right here. Okay? Can you do it? You up for it? Yeah? Okay, at least those two. All right. All right. Now, 
you're going to be like in the Jerry Springer show. Ready? Say Jerry. Jerry, 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 Jerry. Okay, now, Jerry Springer show, you know they leave their IQ points at the door. So you're just reacting. You're a cro magnet man just reacting. Now, I'm going to slap all of you guys. Oh, I left it. All right? Now, middle-aged woman with a clicker comes up and slaps you, and you're in Jerry Springer show. What do you do? Jerry. You slap back. What else do you do? You throw it. Thank you very much. You're welcome over here. All right. Scuba can join. All right. So you slap back. All right? <laughs> Nails just gave you a look. All right. I know, I know. But it doesn't count if you like it. Okay. So, oh. So, okay. So they slap right back. I slap, they slap. I yell, they throw a chair. Who wins? The chair. Jerry. The chair. <laughs> yeah, Jerry Springer, because he makes a lot of money off us fools. The bouncers. The bouncers. Okay. The, in, in civilized world, no one wins when there's aggression. But in the world of power and control and domination, I win, because I got them to lose their focus. They were having a good time, enjoying themselves, and suddenly, because I hit them, now they're in my face, I own them. If we're on a motorcycle, they're on the back. You know what that makes you, right? Okay, now this group here, all of you guys here, and just this, these two row, you are all level two. All right, you're polite folk anywhere. I slap you guys, ready? What do polite, yes, may I have another, right. What do polite folks do with a middle aged woman with a clicker slaps them? They turn the other cheek, all right? What else? Uh, give, me another. give me another, all right? What else? You, you put them at home? I'm not that old, okay? <laughs> what do you do? What do polite people do when someone slaps them? They apologize. I'm sorry my face hit your hand. Sorry to make you mad. Somehow it's all my fault, right? And how do they feel later in the day, polite folk? How do they feel? They take advantage of... Grumpy, they kick the dog, they hit the husband, something happens, right? This is where we have anxiety and depression. Things bother us, we don't take appropriate action, and what happens is we get eaten up. Who wins? I hit, you don't hit, the energy goes sideways. Who's in charge, me or you? No, me again, because I still made you lose your tranquility. I own you, you're still on the back. All right. Now, you guys are Yoda. You ready, Yoda? Oh. Um. You have to say it out loud. They don't have the force. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Now, if you're Yoda and I hit you, you ask me a question. What question do you ask me? Why'd you hit me? Or someone, I heard someone say, hit me, why did you? Right? Okay, now, that's a good question. Now, the nurses at shock trauma came up with a, a, the drink of water test. And this is very important when you're dealing with people that are angry. If I'm angry or you're angry, we both have to pass this test. A full glass of water, I put it to my lips, drink, swallow without choking, spitting, gagging, or throwing, right? Or spilling, not a drop. If I can give it to him and he can do all the same, then we can have a conversation. Otherwise, we should delay. No words are useful in that instance. You go for nonverbal. Now, Yoda, what question do you ask yourselves? I just hit you. You asked me already why I hit you, but what question do you ask yourselves? When do you get your what? <laughs> Go over to Jerry Springer. He's talking about revenge. That's Jerry Springer. Any, uh, yeah, I know, her people. Any anger, any, I mean, any aggression of any kind, any violence is over level three. What does Yoda think? Why did he hit me? How did I contribute to the hit? That's right, you ask for responsibility. It's accountability. How did I contribute to this thing that just happened, right? You ask yourselves without blame. You ask yourselves with curiosity. All right, now you ready to practice? What would you do?
I never said I was a good Catholic. Okay. All right, now Jerry Springerites, my people, what do you do to continue to add negative stuff? He's going to grab the kid and do what, sir? Scream right back at him. You scream at him. What else? What do you do? You, you do what? Just buy the candy. You buy the candy. That is pretty hostile. What else? Leave him there. Throw something back, Leave him there, throw something back <laughs> at him. You, you, will you what? Walk away, leave him. That's a little passive aggressive. Okay, you got to move over. All right, you guys aren't the most aggressive people in the world, but the issue is you do something hostile, you kick the kid, you do something, right? Okay, now polite people everywhere. Ready? What do you? What do most polite people in the grocery store do when a kid's having a fit and a dad's out of control? They do what? They do nothing. They keep shopping. What else? I, I'm sorry, you have a child. You say what? You say you're sorry and you buy two of them. Uh, <laughs> you say you're sorry and you buy two of them. All right, most of us do not much of anything. But many of us do that look, that shame on you look. Let me see it. Oh, you guys are good. All right. It's that you did wrong look. Now, Yoda, what can you do to make the situation better? You've got these two people suffering. We don't know if your kid's got autism. We don't know if his dad just deployed or his mom just deployed. We don't know. What can you guys do to make it better? Invite him into a different what? Guide him into a different cereal that's better for him. Okay, guide him into a different cereal that's better for you. Why not? Let's say. All right, but does he pass the drink of water test? Should you be talking to him? Nope. Nope, so you can't really do that. Ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, she's going to take the action. All right, that was good. Bye. See you later. All right, if you can, that's wonderful. The best responses I've gotten to this is somebody, it was actually um, a lieutenant colonel, no less, said he would get on the floor and have a pataleta, what's the word in English, pataleta, um, temper tantrum next to the kid to distract him, and then they would go on their way. I know another one, a father who said to the, to the father, he said, you know what, he's going to be a great umpire, a great opera singer, a great whatever, so you can turn into positive. My whole point is, reacting with the same kind of yuckiness that someone gives you is a choice, right? And that's certainly helpful to remember in this process. Now, one last thing. Ah, uh, did you give me the benefit of the doubt just because I had the, uh, the, the bride um, uh, doing some gaseous stuff? Did you expect me to not do it this time? The problem is with communication, we expect the same. Again, remember the narrow focus. So I'm going to ask you the rest of today, tomorrow, through the deployment process, remember to give people the benefit of the doubt and look at life with a wide-angle lens. Thank you for playing with me. You've been great. Appreciate it. <laughs> Jerry, my people. All right, before we go everywhere, uh, anywhere, uh, we have Command Sergeant Major Stanikier from the Tech.